Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible, Bible Talk. Talk. <laughs> and again, on behalf of Alice and myself, I want to greet you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes, we do. And we are so blessed that we can come together in, in God's Word, uh, because it's His Word that has Amen. so much power to, to change our lives, to heal our lives, mm. to touch our lives, to, to change our lives. To yes. change our lives. To change our that's lives. what he wants to do, change us. Yes, and that's what we need, because he has promised to bring us from glory, glory to, glory. to glory. He has glory. promised to transform us, conform us into the image of his son, Christ Jesus. And he does that with his word. Amen. Hallelujah. That sword, sharper than two any other two sword, that cuts away the things in us that don't yes. look like Jesus. Yes. We're continuing on. Uh, in our last program, we talked about mammon. We talked about wealth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's such an important top topic uh, and subject that we're going to we're going to continue on in that a little bit. So we're we're going to be in the Sermon on the Mount in the Gospel of Matthew in the sixth chapter. So you might want to open your Bibles and prepare for that. And as I've said before, you know uh, it's it's wise, it's wisdom to do two things: to have a notepad and something to write with, mm -hmm. and you can jot down notes as, as you think of them. And the other thing is always, always, always. Test what I say against the Word of God. Amen. I don't want to give you what my thoughts are. I don't want to give you what my opinions are. I want to give you what the Word of God says. Because I need to hear that as much as, as anybody out there, right? Amen. Yes. So before we start, I'm going to ask Alice if you will ask the Father's blessing upon our time. I will do that. Thank you, Lord. Father, we do. We ask for your blessing on this Word. We ask that we just take it into our hearts and that we are obedient to do yes, what you have commanded us to do, Lord. And we know, Lord, that your word goes forth and accomplishes what you want it to do. So it will touch and change lives. Yes, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, baby. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Lord. Lord. Thank Hallelujah. You, Lord. All right. Uh, I, I've said in a number of recent programs that in our travels, and our travels are fairly extensive. Yeah. And we have the opportunity to meet with Christians in many, many, many parts of the world. Um, what I'm seeing and observing, sad to say, is that so many, and I'll put quotes around this, spirit-filled, spirit-led, Bible-believing yeah. Christians simply don't actually believe the Bible. Yeah. Well, they may believe some verses that, that appeal to them. Right. But you know what? We need to believe the whole word. We need oh, to receive, yes, we need to receive, because it's all God's instruction in our yes. lives, from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. It's not a menu for you to pick the parts you like. It is God's instruction for our full life. For our, He came, He's not trying to oppress us, He is trying to set us free. He came to set the captives free, and He does that with His word. And he isn't commanding us to do no. anything that we can't accomplish. Amen. Because he's given us the Holy Spirit, the power to be able to do it. And that's the truth. And that's the truth. Okay. Amen. <laughs> okay. One of the reasons I, I believe that we're seeing this in the lives of believers is that the Word of God is being choked in their yes. lives, stifled yeah. in their lives. You know, I, I said... From, as, from last week, in Matthew 13, 22, in the parable of the sower and the seed, Jesus said, And the one on whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. The King James says the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. They strangle the life out of the one who has heard mm -hmm. and received the word, if you allow those to exist in your life. Yes. Okay, that's contrasted with the one who hears the word and understands it. So understand this, okay? In Matthew 6, 19, I'm going to read 19 to 21. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We talked about this in our last program, but again, I'm saying, you know, I, we need to hear these things yes. more than once, I promise. Yes. 
what are treasures? Treasures are the things that most people dearly prize. The right. things in your life that you dearly Hang prize, on to. that are mm -hmm. precious to you. Mm -hmm. You know, it's been said that one man's trash is another man's treasure. <laughs> but what we need to do is determine what do we, what's precious in our lives. Right. Okay, because that's what your treasure is, whatever is precious. Now, if we're talking about wealth, then it's going to be silver and gold. It's mm -hmm. precious to you in your life. Mm -hmm. Okay. When we started this program, gosh, a long time ago. Well, it's, it's gosh, you've got to be close to a year and a half ago yeah. in search of Christianity, looking for true biblical faith in the world. Because remember, Jesus said when he returns, when the Son of Mary returns, will he find faith? Mm -hmm. That's that's what he's looking for. So obviously it should be what we desire to be living by, right? Amen. I said that true discipleship is about a commitment to Jesus Christ without concern for the cost or the consequence on this planet, all right? Mm -hmm. So that like Paul, we can say, and I'm going to read to you from Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 9, right? You turn into that? Yes, I am. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Because the reward is righteousness, which comes from God on the basis of faith. That's why we can give these things. Now, you know, Paul, he treasured. It said he had a zeal for the law and the traditions of men, for the mm -hmm. tradition of the elders. That was what he had treasured. But now he says he counts it all lost to know Christ. You know what was precious to Christ? To, to Paul, rather? Uh, it was it's precious to Paul. Yeah. <laughs> Paul, he, because he had said, I have determined to know nothing but Christ and him crucified. Right. That atoning work of Jesus Christ on the cross, that gift of the Father to us, Mm -hmm. To do for us what we could never do for ourselves. That's what was Paul's treasure. That's what he counted as precious right. in his life. All right? The love that Jesus showed. So you'll be able to, you know, I, I, I said the song, I, I love this song, I Surrender All. Mm -hmm. And as many times as I've gone and, go on and taught and preached around the world, I, I, I'll ask people often to sing that song. But I'll say, before you do, let me caution you. If you, if you don't mean it. Don't say it. Don't say it. All right? Don't, don't say it. How can you surrender all? Well, you can if you trust the one that you give it to. When you surrender it, you're giving it to somebody. Right. Okay? When General Lee surrendered to General Grant at Appomattox, he handed him his sword. It's, yes. it's more than symbolic. Right. It's you're, you're entrusting him. You're saying, okay, I surrender. I give you this. Right. When you surrender something, you have to give it to somebody. So when you surrender all, you have to give it to somebody. You have to trust somebody with it. Just thinking about that, giving over the sword, that was what he used to defend his life. Yes. So he's giving everything over. That. Surrendering. Yes. Yeah. Surrendering, Surrendering all. Yeah. Right? If you trust Jesus, you can surrender all to him. Yes, you can. Now, when it comes to money, mm -hmm. you know, think about this. I, I really, I want, I want you to consciously ponder this. You, if you get a paycheck from your employer, and you go to the bank, and you deposit it, you have trusted that bank with what is precious to you. I mean, you went and worked for it. You earned it all. You know, it's hard-earned cash. And so you are entrusting them. You obviously you wouldn't give it to them if you didn't trust them. Mm -hmm. right. And yet, I mean, we're here in England as we do this particular program. I can remember a number of years we were here, and there was a right. bank that failed here in yes. the UK. Yes. People, people had trusted that bank with their money. There are countries around. Oh, my goodness gracious. The, the state of the world that we're living in right now. There are people. In, look at what situation in Greece and in, in Venezuela. You know, people have trusted these banks, with it, and the banks failed them. Yeah. They, when they say a bank failed. The money's gone. Well, you got to understand, the bank has failed somebody. Yes. 
All of the people that trusted that bank with their money when they handed it over. If you trust the world, shame on you. Go read what it says in Jeremiah 17 when it says, Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and flesh. Right? Because they'll, they'll fail you all the time. But how blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. So don't surrender anything to somebody you don't trust. But surrender it all to Jesus. Amen. Because you can trust Him. Amen. Check it out. Matthew 6, 22 and 23 says this. The eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness... How great is the darkness. I said last week, and I'm, I'm going I'm, I'm to make this the reality of my life to understand this. Okay, we, we talked about money, dollars, pounds, sterling, euros, I mean, however it appears. But faith is the currency of the kingdom of God, all right? The eye is a lamp of the body, so if your eye is clear. You know, the King James says, if therefore thy eye be single. Mm. Now, you know, that's actually a better translation, yeah. but it's harder for people to understand, okay? It's the focus. Because it's about focus, mm -hmm. focused on one thing, all right? Um, that, may, that does make a big difference. In the, in it the does. It does. Yeah. A, a lot of times, you know, translations are trying to, and they, uh, they'll admit this. I mean, go look at translations, the websites of the publishers. They're trying to make it easier to understand. Mm -hmm. That's not their job. No. Jesus Christ said he would send the Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth. The Holy Spirit is the one that will interpret Scripture with the Scripture, okay? That's right. If your eye is single, what does that mean? Well, how many of you have ever been around somebody who's cross-eyed? Mm -hmm. Now, if you're out there now and, and you happen to be cross-eyed, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray right now that oh, the Lord God goodness. would give you singleness of eye, all right? Amen. Not, not so that you look different, not so that you can function differently on earth, but so that you can function differently spiritually. That your eye will be fixed on Jesus Christ, the author, the finisher, the perfecter of your faith. Yes, because when you see somebody cross I, I'm just going to be perfectly frank, I'm going to be honest with you. We're called to speak the truth. It's uncomfortable to be around somebody that's cross eyed, especially if they're badly cross eyed, because you're not quite sure. What they're looking, they're looking at. at. I mean, yeah. you can be sit there and they can be talking to you and they have one eye looking at you and one eye looking over there and you're not quite sure what they're actually focused on. Right. Right? And when you look at somebody, you look at their eyes and if they're going different directions, you, you don't know which eye to look at. Right. And, and the problem is that's one of the most obvious eye problems there is. I mean, you can have yeah. all kinds of eye problems and nobody's going to notice, all right? No, that one is but when somebody is cross-eyed, that's, that's very, very noticeable and very uncomfortable to be around. Mm -hmm. So... Christians who have one eye fixed on Jesus Christ and one eye fixed on the world and the things of the world, you can't be more cross-eyed than that because those are the, you can't get farther apart than those two things. And I mean, they are very uncomfortable to be around. Well, it's uncomfortable for me to be around cross-eyed Christians right. spiritually. Yeah. I mean, and I'm talking about spiritually. Yes. You know, you, you sit around and you fellowship with somebody who is fixed on the word over here, fixed on the world over there, and you don't know where they are. You have no idea, right? right. So make sure that you have made a decision in your life. Is this not what it's always about? Is this not what God spoke through Joshua in the wilderness when he said, you know, choose you this day whom you will serve? You can't serve two masters, right? Choose who you will. Is that not what God sent Elijah up the mountain when he came back into Israel? And he said that he brought the people up on the mountaintop and said, you know, how long will you be divided? You can't have... You can't have two opinions, okay? You're, you're either, Jesus said you're either for him or against him. It's one or the other. Because that next verse, and this is, this is the focal point, okay? Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. That's right. He's not saying that you shouldn't. Mm -mm. He's saying you cannot. It's impossible to do it. So you'll, you'll, and Christians deceive themselves and, and think that they can walk a middle road down there. There is no middle road. Mm -hmm. There is that narrow, straight way that leads to life. And there's that broad, right. easy way that leads to destruction. Mm -hmm. There's no middle ground here. 
This is important. This is so, so It's so important. important. And this is why I think that I find that so many believers who are so troubled in the world is because they haven't made that decision. decision. Yeah. They haven't committed to a single decision yeah. to follow Jesus Christ, regardless of the cost, regardless of the consequence, that you have decided to follow Jesus. And until you make that decision, you'll be in turmoil, absolute turmoil. And that's the truth. And that's the truth. Okay. Hmm. Remember, the Lord had to deliver his people from Pharaoh in Egypt. This is where the people of God, I mean, this is where it starts when he brings them, sends Moses into the land to bring them out as a people, okay? Yes. Because they couldn't stay there. You know, it says we're to be submissive to governing authorities. While they were in Egypt, they needed to be submitted to governing authorities. They needed to be submitted to the Pharaoh. Oh, boy. But no man can serve two masters. So God said, well, okay, I'll bring them out so that they can serve me. Yes. Because... They had to be brought away from the Pharaoh and the world and the things of the world in order to serve God. And God was willing to do some pretty astounding things to make that happen, to accomplish it, okay? Let's start with a, a word from James, James 4, 7. It says, submit therefore to God. Yes. This, is, this has got to be the core of our desire and our goal. Now, it says the goal of our instruction is love. But that love is going to give us the power to submit to God because we trust in His love for us, all right? All authority is from God. That's, isn't this what Jesus said, that good confession that He made before Pontius Pilate? Mm. When Pontius Pilate was astounded that here, this man on trial for his life, didn't seem impressed by, by Pilate. Not, didn't seem... He wasn't shaking in his boots. He wasn't scared. He wasn't pleading for his life. No. And Pilate, why don't you ask me? Don't you know that I have the power of life and death? Yes. And Jesus said, you have no power, no authority, unless it came from my Father. Mm. So, you can't serve God and wealth. Riches. The first thing Jesus said is, I mean, what, he, what he's telling us, what he's training us in here is, that wealth is not a servant. It won't serve you. It is a master. Yes. Jesus said you can't serve two masters. Mm -hmm. Either God's is a master or wealth is a master, right? Everybody seems to think, everybody seems to think, in the, at least in a natural, mm -hmm. and Christians can think in a natural, that wealth will give them control over things. That wealth will give them power over things. They've been, they've been led all of their lives to believe that wealth will serve them and give them mastery. Wealth, according to Jesus Christ, who is the Word, mm -hmm. who is the truth, says that wealth will put you in bondage because it, it, it is a master. That's right. And it's a hard, harsh taskmaster at that. You become a slave to it. I'm sorry, did I just hear you say, well, if I had money, I, would... mm, I wouldn't be like that. I wouldn't be like that. Why I would do it different. Jeremiah okay. said in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is more it's deceitful than all else and desperately sick. Who can understand it? It's the truth. Yes. It's the truth. If, if you seek riches, it will be a master over you. It will rule your life. You know, our dear brother, now going on to be with the Lord, in a much better place than we are, hallelujah, mm. Arthur Burke, used to say that what a man believes rules him. Mm -hmm. Okay? If you believe that money is, is the answer to your problems, that will rule you, okay? If you believe that Jesus Christ is the answer to every need that you have, to every desire that you have, you know what? Then he'll rule you. Because he is Lord. Yes, yes. But he's a loving God. Hallelujah. Think about what I said, right? It, it says the same thing in the Gospel of Mark. The worries of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, mm -hmm. and it becomes unfruitful. Okay? This is what you've heard all about. I mean, you've been told all your life that money will a answer all the problems. All the, everything that you need comes from money. Okay. So, Matthew 6.25. I'm going to zoom right along here. Mm -hmm. For this reason, Jesus said, for this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat 
or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Mm -hmm. You know, the King James says, therefore, I say to you, all right? The, 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 He's trying to set us free. He came to set the captives free. Yes, he did. Right? Yeah, I, when I teach, and I, you know, I preach, how many times have you heard me say this? I'll, I'll ask a question I'll, like this to the congregation, and everybody stands, sits there and stares at me. I say, wait a minute. If I ask you a question, you, you have to answer. You've got to give me an answer. If Jesus Christ gives you a question, if he asks you a question, he wants an answer. Yes. So here's the question, all right? Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? That's a question that the Lord God Almighty, the one who went to a cross to save you, mm. that's a question he's asking you. Have you ever thought, stopped and thought about that question? What's your life about? Mm. Is it about the things? Is it about the, the food? Is it about the clothing? Is it about your house and your car? Is that what your life is about? Mm. That's a very good question. Because without doubt, Jesus said this, because you can't serve God while you're serving mammon. Mm -hmm. You'd better not be worried about the following things, those, those things, or you will not. Not mm -hmm. that you might not. Mm -hmm. You will not be serving God. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to get to heaven and stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and have him say, Depart from me, I never knew you. And you sure don't. No. You sure don't. See, you, you, better, you better start... This is a life and death matter. This is not, okay, Sunday school, let's try and get a star on it. This is life and death. The Word of God is life. Jesus Christ, who is the Word of God, said, I am the life. He said, I am the truth. I am the way. If you're not following the Word, you're on the, you're, you've, you've lost your way. And you're not living a, a life, okay? So think about this next verse. Matthew 6, 26. And please, make a note of this. Go back and read it afterwards. Go back and talk to the Lord about this. Jesus says, Look at the birds of the air that they do not sow, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? Yes. Another question. I'm giving you a couple of seconds to answer the question. Are you not worth more than them? This is a question that Jesus asked you. He takes care of them. If you'll take care of them, aren't you worth more? See, so the command is, yes, did you realize that it was a command for us to look at the birds of the air? Yes. It doesn't mean to casually glance at them. Not to just glance at the next bird you see. It's, it, this is like David saying in Psalm 8, when I consider yes. thy heaven is the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained. It means that we are to meditatively consider what he's pointing out. Absolutely. Why? And, and by the way, the Greek word that, yeah, that's used for, for look at in, yes. in that verse, it implies a close penetrating look. Mm. I mean, really, really considering it. Why would you want to do that? Why do you have to look at the birds? Why do you have to look at the moon and the stars? Well, it says in Romans 1.20, Paul wrote, For since the creation of the world, his, God's invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Okay? He's speaking to us through his yes. creation. But I want you to know, when he says, you know, to, to look at that, that's, that's a command of God. Yes. Yeah. This, is, this is not just a suggestion. No. It's not like, oh, here's an exercise for... This is God's command in your life. And you better understand that from Genesis 1 run to Revelations 22, right at the end, there's not a single suggestion. I mean, these are not suggestions. These are the commands of the one who is our Lord and Master. And you better start treating them as such. Are you not worth much more than they? Are you not worth much more than they? The birds, right? The King James says, are you not of more value? Okay. Jesus asked that question. Have you ever answered it? It sounds to be a rhetorical question. However, it's worthy of, it demands an answer in order for a person to truly understand the first part of that verse. How much are you worth? 
Well, you know, the average human body, I, you know, I'm not a chemist, I'm not a biologist, but it's not worth a lot of money in cash dollars, okay? Mm-hmm. It's got oxygen, phosphorus, carbon, potassium, hydrogen, nitrogen. It's got all kinds of stuff in there, right? And if you, if you sold it for the value of that, it would be a few dollars, all right? And that's um, all stuff that God made. It was interesting because when I was first doing this study, I actually looked up and I saw that in the New York Times in, in February of 2011, they had an article. And they said, well, you could bump up the value of a human being. <laughs> if you really wanted to make a buck with your body, the best thing would be to sell the individual organs. Right. Okay, but another suggestion would be to sell your skin so you could tan your hide and sell this leather. <laughs> Not my suggestion. They're just saying, okay. Yikes. But at the end of the day, back in 2011, they say your body, your whole deal, your flesh, that thing that you I'll carry around with it, okay. is worth about four and a half, five dollars. Mm. Okay? Well, leaving that behind, okay, the, the worth of a commodity, anything, the worth, the value of anything, is ultimately determined by what somebody's willing to pay for it. Right. You know, I, I use this example all the time. If you have a car, you want to sell it? And you say it's worth uh, five thousand dollars. If nobody in the world will pay you five thousand dollars, it's not worth five thousand nope. dollars. But if somebody came along and said, "Well, I'm, well I'll give you six thousand dollars," how much is the car worth? It's worth six thousand. Mm-hmm. Because ultimately, that thing is worth what somebody is willing to pay. So now consider the words of Paul to the church at Corinth: "For you have been bought with a price; therefore, glorify God in your body." First Corinthians six twenty. The Lord, who watches over his word to perform it, has then fulfilled the promise that he made through the prophet Isaiah over 2,700 years ago. Because he said in Isaiah 43, But now, thus says the Lord your Creator, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. A redeemer, a goel in Hebrew, it has the right to purchase or ransom a kinsman from bondage to a foreigner. The price that the Father paid for you and for me was not five shekels, five pounds, five euros, five dollars. The price that he paid to ransom you, to ransom me, to ransom my precious Alice, Mm. was his son Jesus Christ. That's how much you're worth. And if you don't get that, if you don't get the fact that you are worth Jesus Christ, you will not understand the things of God, and Satan will be able to rob the things of God from you. I'm telling you the truth. I'm just, I am just I have no chance in the world of finishing this study as I, as I would like to. But I'm going to go to, and I'd like you to turn with me if you would, to Isaiah 43, verse 1. I'm just going to quickly read one verse. The fourth verse. The Lord says through the prophet, Since you are precious in my sight, since you are honored and I love you, I will give other men in your place and other peoples in exchange for your life. You are God's treasure here on earth. You are what is precious to Him. Mm. Father, we thank You, Lord God, for Your great, great love. Mm. So great that You gave Your Son, Jesus Christ, that we are so loved by You, that we are so precious to You, that You you call us Your treasure, Lord God. Mm. Father, help us to understand that and to walk in the fullness of that. That we, people would see your work in our lives for your glory, for the glory of your name, Father. In Jesus' name I ask that. Amen. Oh, well, till next time, God bless you and goodbye. So I cherish that old rugged cross till my trophy.